Okay, well, thank you very much for that very generous uh, introduction there. And it's, it's fantastic. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk to you today. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the lessons I think we've learned whilst trying to build out new storage technologies. Um, you know, I, I spent the last sort of uh, 10, 12 years building out different types of storage systems. And I've worked with many, many people during that time. And I can't possibly mention them all, but the work that you're going to hear today and the, uh, and the lessons that we've learned really is as a, as a cumulative effort across everybody. And I've mentioned a few of the people here. And as we go through the, through the talk, when we get particular points, I'll mention some of the other people. But um, this talk today is really going to be composed of three parts. Uh, the first part is, why do we actually need to even think about new storage technologies? I mean, you know, flash hard disk drives, tape, they've all been around for a long time. They're all widely used. Why should we think about new storage technologies? I'm then going to talk to you a little bit about silica and our work in trying to understand how to uh, take a new media glass and to make it into an archive storage technology. Then I'm going to share some of the lessons that we've learned and you know, some very brief thoughts at the end about where we might be heading. So let's start. Why do we need to think about new uh, technologies for storage? Now, uh, I think there is this sort of uh, thing about all technologies, which is that they exist on this S-curve. And I'm going to call it the curse of the S-curve. And if you think of any technology over time against some metric of interest, perhaps that's gigabytes per dollar, perhaps that's IOPS per dollar, uh, whatever the metric is, any technology follows a path. You start off where you make very little progress on that metric of interest, and it's really hard. But then you get to some point where it really takes off. And at that point, you get the rules of thumbs, like you know, capacity of a hard disk drive used to double every two years, or Moore's law, and so forth. And then you get to the point of maturity. And no technology escapes this. At some point, you're going to get to this point. And that's when it gets really hard. That's when you're having to put a lot of effort in to get, relatively speaking, small gains, often not giving you the same benefit in terms of that dollar per gigabyte or IOPS or whatever it is of the metric that is of interest to you. And the unfortunate news is, is that if you look at our technologies today, not just across storage, but across networking and compute, in fact, compute with Moore's law and then our scaling come to the end, we've, we've seen for some time the impact that that's had. The bad news is, across uh, both networking and storage, we are ending or we are getting to that point of maturity for many of the technologies that we rely on today. And that means there is going to be new technologies. That's not going to be simply evolutions. It's likely to be completely new step changes. Now, I want to try to give you a feel for like, what that looks like in reality. And I'm going to use hard disk drives and flash. Um, now, here I've got a graph which is showing you sort of basically capacity, um, uh, a, a chart for capacity. It's showing you time on the bottom, and it's showing you capacity in terabytes on a log scale. Now, what you can see here is that up until about 2005, life was really great. Basically, what was happening was that the hard disk drive manufacturers were riding aerial density. They were simply increasing the number of bits they could get on each platter. It was extremely predictable. It was extremely controllable. And you see that kind of uh, uh, takeoff phase where it just keeps going. It keeps doubling every few years. And then you hit around 2005, and life starts to get hard because simply riding that aerial density curve is no longer working. And at that point, you start to see innovations come. You start to see more platters put inside a hard disk drive. And to do that, you start to see things like them becoming helium filled and sealed. Some of you will also be familiar with things like shingle drives. Of course, they come along, and that gives you another boost. But you know, it's only a small boost. And that's because you're basically in this final stage where you're really riding these one-off increments to give you the benefits. Now, of course, today, uh, the new hope is Hammer, um, a technology that's been a long time in development. But I think even if you had Hammer drives, uh, the odds of them being much more than 100 terabytes feels quite low. 
Now, I'm sure there's people here from the hard disk drive companies. Uh, afterwards, one of you can dive up to, the, up to the microphone and tell me I'm wrong. But I'd go out on a limb and say, I think it would be really hard to build uh, hammer drives that are more than 100 terabytes. But life's even worse than that. Because if you look at a hard disk drive as well, what you see is over time, they're not actually able to increase the throughput that you're getting because we're starting to ride simply platters with one head. And so your access rate, the number of IOs per terabyte that you can sustain, starts to drop dramatically. And then you get, again, one-off hits like dual actuators. But that only gives you a factor of two. And that's going to very soon disappear as you push those densities up. Now, you might think, well, that's great. That's hard disk drives, and they're fairly unique. Well, let's talk about flash next. So this is a similar chart showing time, and it's showing you different technologies uh, all the way up to four bits per uh, cell. And basically, if you look at the journey of flash, in the early years, there was a lot of basically feature size reduction. It was just about actually creating smaller and smaller features. Then, of course, when that stops becoming so easy, people used to move to multi-level, and then they used to multi-layer, so, uh, and now they're actually moving to these multi-deck, where you basically stack multiple dies on top of each other. Now, really interesting, this chart was first produced by one of my colleagues uh, uh, in the team, and uh, he put a prediction on it, uh, on the dotted line of, of where he thought it would be, and that was in 2018. And interestingly, Flash has not really managed to increase that uh, aerial density uh, much beyond what we expected. In order to keep that going, there's going to be another trick that's going to have to be found. Uh, and it's unclear what that trick is. It's really unclear. Now, that to me starts to tell the story of why we need to look at new technologies. Now, the next thing you might be thinking, well, that's great, but why is a guy from Microsoft stood there talking about this? Well, I think that the cloud gives us an amazing opportunity. Now, I've done this sort of graph. This is quite sort of pictorial, so don't quite uh, interpret it very literally. But basically, if you think of scale of deployment along one axis, and you think of sort of levels of customization, I'm going to call it, you start off with nothing. You just go out and buy something and deploy it. Uh, the next one up is you start to do some software mods. You start to think of a new custom stack. Then you start to think about the hardware and the system, the enclosures, the way that the rack is designed. The next level up on that chart would be thinking about the device, the actual device itself. You know, a hard disk drive being a device, or a flash drive being a device. Then you get to media. And in a sense, that's what I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, where we started to think, OK, let's now think, what does it do if you go to media? And then, of course, at the limit, you get to this sort of top level, which is then you're really thinking of the material as well. In other words, how do I produce materials uh, which are going to be able to provide better bases for building storage on from scratch? Now, clearly, as you go up this stack, the level of customization increases, the cost increases significantly. And what I've tried to show here is, is that I think when you look at the cloud era, the scale of deployment of storage in the hyperscaler clouds gives us permission to go after that entire stack now. And that's why someone from Microsoft, in a sense, has stood here, because it's super important to us when you're operating at these massive scales to have the technology that you need to allow you to be really successful. Now, in a sense, in my career, I feel I sort of spent the time going up this ladder. Um, each time I've gone up, I've had to learn a little bit more. I'm a computer scientist, but I had to learn a bit about, uh, uh, about sort of uh, electronics. Uh, as you go through up into the media, you begin to learn a little bit more about physics because you're now working with physicists as well. And so I'm going to talk to you about some of the lessons that we've learned on that journey. Now, where did we start moving up? Now, I started sort of going up that, up that stack because um, I was really interested in archival storage. And I think at the time, we were just beginning to see large tape systems being deployed in cloud. And um, I think one thing which is just super true is that few people really aspire to use tape for archival storage. It is one of those things which you use because it's going to be cheap. But it's really difficult to use it. You have to be really worried about the failure modes. You have to be really worried about the environment that you install tape in. You've got to be really worried about the access patterns. A modern LTO9 tape will be about two kilometers long, which you'll have to spool every time you access it. 
Um, it's a real nightmare. And basically what happens if you, do, if you use tape at scale, very quickly the dollar to ter terabyte uh, benefit that on paper people talk about can very easily be lost to effectively complexity. So we thought, hey, wouldn't it be better not to use tape at all? And so uh, where our journey started was to think, well, can we build a system? Can we go to that level three? Can we go out and design a rack from the ground up uh, in order to store archival data? And we did that in a project that we called Pelican. And it was quite, a, we quite an unusual design. It was basically a rack just absolutely crammed with disks. It had very little cooling capability. Uh, in fact, only had three fans for cooling all of the disks. Only a small number of those disks could be spun up at any one time because we were worried about the energy usage. And in order to communicate, we only had two servers, which were, we stretched the PCIe bus across the entirety of the, um, of the entirety of the back of the rack. And this was all in sort of 2013, 2014. And um, we really struggled to get it to work. We were really struggling to get sort of these components, things like the PCIe bus, things like the hard disk drives to do what we wanted. And you know, the hard disk drives, the firmware is a black box. You know, you're struggling to understand what it's doing and why it's doing it. Uh, PCI chipsets were quite buggy at the time. And it was becoming a real nightmare. And um, I'm gonna show you one graph that we generated at the time, which sort of shows the level that we were having to go to and the kind of challenges that we were facing trying to get this hard disk drive based archival storage rack working. Now, what this chart is showing you is the power draw for uh, a set of hard disk drives. Um, the manufacturers were anonymized when we, when we put it out there. Uh, and it shows you time, and it shows you the power draw against time. And what you've got here is the disk is in standby. So its electronics are powered up, but the platter's not spinning. At time zero, you ask the hard disk drive to spin up. And then you monitor the power draw. You let it stabilize, and then at 18 seconds, you ask it to spin down. Now, what I want you to take away from this is, uh, not necessarily the details, but some of the really interesting characteristics. Each of the hard disk drives is really very different. Um, you know, we could probably cope quite happily with the starting, uh, you know, 10 seconds being quite different. What's really weird also is that, you know, when you ask a hard disk drive to spin down, for up to eight seconds afterwards, it can keep operating. Now, there is, no, there is no instruction that you can send to a hard disk drive to say, what are you doing? I have asked you to spin down. Are you doing it? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of thing, is like also, you can see that there are spikes. Even when you ask it to spin down, you can see that a hard disk drive spikes. And the problem is, is it's extremely hard to then build systems which are trying to balance energy, be extremely careful. If you're trying to build a rack to do hard disk drive storage, which is only going to use two kilowatts, you really are worried about how every watt is being used. So we were in this stage and we thought, it's time to move on. Let's forget trying to take hard disk drives, work out what they're doing under the covers, work out how to make them cheaper, work out how to actually make them operate. Let's start to think, is there something better that we could build? And that's where we started Project Silica. Now, Project Silica started because at the University of Southampton, uh, there was a lab there in the, in the ORC where there was a pre pre professor called Peter, Kik Peter Kazansky who had demonstrated the ability to write data into glass. Now, you went into a large room, and at one end, there was an optical bench with a large laser on it, and at a few bits per second, they were writing data into pieces of glass. And then what I like to call graduate speed, because that was then taken to a reading head, which was actually a microscope, and some poor graduate was there trying to actually decode the data. And uh, error correction was effectively trying to then look at where, what, were we getting enough, were they getting enough characters that recognizable out of the piece of glass to say that the data that had been written into it was actually being read from it. Now, whilst it was really early, we thought uh, rather naively, and uh, how, how hard can it be to actually make this into an actual storage system? Um, I, think, I think if we'd known how hard it was going to be, we probably never would have started. 
But subsequently, a massive team of people have come together in order to work out how to take that breakthrough that happened at Southampton and try to translate it into a storage system that can work at the cloud scale. So let me tell you a little bit about it. So when we thought about glass, uh, we were really looking for new material, a new media, because we really felt that magnetic media was not the right way to store data for the long term. Now, basically, magnetic media, as we all know, has many bad properties. It degrades, degrades, it's susceptible to bit rot. You have to basically refresh that hardware every few years. You have to do sort of fixation checks. You have to scrub the data. There's a lot of things that you have to do. And effectively, it's, very, very, uh, it's a very unsustainable approach to doing things. And the base observation, and this is the first thing that we started to really think about as we look back, the first lesson, is that you, if you look at storage systems today, most of the emissions, and by that I mean the CO2 that producing them <coughs> generates, most of the energy that they use and the cost of store data scale with the lifetime of the data that's stored inside that system. And that's not great. So when we looked at glass, what we saw was a low-cost material. So if you think normally you spend, you know, 100 bucks on, a, on an LTO tape, here you get a piece of glass, uh, which really is very, very cheap. It's a very durable media. Uh, once you write the data into it, there is basically no bit rot. The data is going to be inside that piece of glass for thousands of years. It's extremely resilient to water, to, to uh, electromagnetic fields thrown at it. It's a right once media, but it's so cheap that that doesn't really matter. So it's not about having to do garbage collection, the fact that it's cheap. And in fact, for archival storage, arguably, a worm media is actually a bonus. Um, and because it's so stable and inert, you don't really need to worry about scrubbing. And so you can then think of it like, well, we're not really going to try to keep the data in situ for thousands of years in a data center, but at least we can leave the data in situ for the lifetime of the data center. And that brings us to the second principle, operational proportionality. So what, I th what we think of is that the cost and the energy and the emissions that are generated of the data storage should scale with the operations performed on the data, not on the lifetime of the data. Now, if you can build storage systems like that, you start to change the way that we think about storage. You start to change the balance of how you think about it. Because no longer is it, well, if I keep this data, it's going to be more expensive. It's going to be. It's now a, a thinking where you think, OK, keeping the data for another year actually doesn't really cost me anything. So I'm, I, I can do it if I want to do it. So I want to show you a little video to give you an idea of how we write data into the glass. Uh, we use a femtosecond pulsed laser. Uh, so if you think of a piece of glass, we actually write data into We write hundreds of layers of data into the glass. And you could think of them as, as sectors. We run the video. So you have this piece of glass, and you have this laser beam. And effectively, what you're doing is you're writing these layers of structures. Now, the layers of are these structures that you write inside are able to, be, to encode data based on their orientation and or depth. We use orientation mainly. And you write these layers in the glass from the bottom of the glass up. And you can create hundreds of layers inside the glass. And each one of those little sort of blocks that you see forming, we think of that as a track. And each layer with inside it is a sector. And once you've written the data, you then obviously want to be able to read it. And reading uses a completely different process. So writing uses these femtosecond lasers. It modifies the glass. The reading is done using basically a microscope, a polarization microscope. Uh, it uses low-powered illumination. And this means you can't sort of like destroy the data because, in effect, the process of reading puts so little power in, it doesn't impact the actual uh, voxels that are stored inside it. Um, and what we do is actually, rather than reading a single voxel at a time, we actually just image the glass. And we actually image an entire two-dimensional sector in one go. So rather than reading one voxel at a time, like you might do in a traditional storage system, we just image it. And interestingly, we don't spin the glass. And I'm going to tell you in a bit why we don't spin the glass. But because we have hundreds of layers, 
we were able to get a certain amount of throughput by actually going through the glass. So rather than trying to go around the glass, you go through it. Uh, and then you have to move from one stack to another stack if you want to be able to read across multiple tracks. Um, now, once you've imaged that piece of glass, we have to use machine learning. And, and it's very, very, very topical. Uh, I know that, uh, yeah, it was, you know, the opening comments. So um, we use machine learning. We actually use convolutional neural networks. So we actually just feed an entire image of the sector into a convolutional neural network, which basically produces out a probability distribution for all symbols in that sector. Uh, and then we provide, we use standard error correction codes and things like that on top of that. So we use an LDPC code as well as, uh, as other codes which run across multiple platters so we can get resilience to platter loss. Um, what's really interesting is, is that the, you know, the ML at the moment is a, is a, is a, you know, can be thought of as a decode stack. Intuitively, you might have thought, let's put that on the drive. So you know, we have a drive, it's going to image, and at the end of it will, will come ones and zeros, which is the data that you're trying to read. Uh, that's not how we view it. We view it more as out of the drive comes images. And then you use a microservice that you run on the cloud in order to allow you to then decode that data. Uh, and I think that has several advantages. One of the advantages is you take a lot of complexity out of the drives because you don't need to put all the decode hardware in them. Uh, another one is, is that you can do tricks to do sort of like when you've got resources which are underutilized, you're able to maximize their use in the cloud and things like that. So it's kind of a different way of thinking about how we build these things. It's about not putting as much as we can into the hardware. It's actually trying to keep the hardware as simple as possible to give us the maximum flexibility, which kind of comes back to that thing about hard disk drives. And when you ask them to spin down, sort of like, what are you doing? Uh, if, you've got very, if you're running very, very low to the, to the hardware, you've actually got more chance to understand what's going on at the higher layers. So the data lifetime in the silica system is really easy. It comes in, it gets staged. Uh, we do a certain amount of coding on it. We get it split down. We actually decide what we're going to write to a platter. Uh, we're going to write, we, effectively, you're going to think of it as a process where we write entire platters in a go. So you put your data, you write it. I told you that the write technology and the read technology were very different. So it's super important once we've written it to then do the, a verify using the technology that we're going to use to actually read it ultimately. So we write the data into a platter. Uh, at write time, there's certain checks that make it feel that it's done it correctly. We then put it into a separate drive, which is the read drive, where we're able to verify the data is actually correct. If you can read it when you've, when you've finished doing the verify phase, then you're very confident that in the future you'll be able to read it when required to do so. And basically then you get on-demand reads coming in. Now, I, I sort of now want to sort of say, so I've talked to you a bit about the technology, and I want to just talk to you a little bit about the workload. Because one of the things that we've also learned uh, was the, really the importance of looking and understanding and thinking about the workloads. And actually, challenging our assumptions. So um, when we started Pelican and when we started doing Silica, uh, a lot of people would say to us, ah, oh, you know, it's all about high throughput drives because you're going to get massive reads reading back terabytes in a go. So if you, think of the high, if you think of the tape industry, you know, they like to have tape drives which are extremely fast, 350, 400 megabytes per second. And the, with the sort of sense that you put a tape in, you spool it for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, you then read terabytes out, which takes seconds, more seconds, as it were, and then you spool it back or spool it to the end and then spool it back. And so the cost of spooling versus the cost of read is nicely balanced to some, to some definition. Uh, so we actually went off and studied in, uh, in our systems what the uh, Cloud Archival Service was doing. And it's a standard sort of 10 hour plus SLO archive service backed by tape. And um, you know, we found that there was basically a long-term average, 47 times more data written and 170 times more IOs, write IOs, than read. So the data is very write intensive, which you kind of expect. Um, there's a lot of variability. Um, in fact, there's seven orders of magnitude variability uh, between the mean to tail, even within a DC. Across DCs, there's variability as well. 
up to five orders of magnitude difference. And here's a chart just showing you the um, tail of the, uh, of the median, uh, by, uh, sorry, the tail divided by the read uh, throughput. So basically, the read and write band bandwidths need to be able to be provisioned and scaled independently of the system. A lot of it is based about different operating, so be able to scale them independently in different places. And so that really drove us to think hard then about, well, how do we actually build a library? How do we actually design a full system that will allow silica to shine? Um, because a lot of, I think a lot of the time at the start, we just thought, can we just take a currently existing tape library and just mod it? And I think the answer is be no. Um, archival workloads, I mean, I think this is also really, really surprising. They are really IOPS dominated. So I'm going to say that 58% of the reads are for less than four megabytes. So 58% of the IO, IO operations that are performed are for reads of less than four megabytes. But only 1.2% of the total uh, read bytes come from those. 85% of the bytes read are for 256 megabyte reads, uh, but they're less than 2% of the total read requests. So there's this kind of interesting pattern where uh, you know, in, in networking world, you'd think of this as sort of mice and elephants, where there's lots of small reads and you'd like to be able to service them. Uh, and you also have some large reads as well, which you need to service efficiently. Um, the other really interesting thing is that there was about a 10 order of magnitude range in file sizes. So, you know, we did see some very large files, as well as a large number of really small files. So... The really interesting thing about this is, is that this really impacts how you think about the storage system that you're going to build. Um, and as I say here, it's sort of like basically the per drive read throughput is less important. Um, and if you've got these very large files, you can shard them across multiple platters to help get the throughput from multiple drives to service the really large files. Um, but it is a lot because there's so many IOs happening. It's really about minimizing mechanical overheads. It's about being able to load something in, access it quickly, uh, minimizing the mounting, the seat delays, and so forth. Now, this is one reason why we didn't want to do things like spinning media and stuff like that. To stabilize spinning media takes 10, around 10 seconds. In fact, from the hard disk drive slide I showed you earlier, they do it between about sort of six to eight to nine seconds, and they're, and they're pretty good at it. So you basically want to get to something where you can just get it in really quickly go to a particular location, read the small file, and then free the drive, drive up. Now, I want to give you a feel for what this looks like at the end. So we basically, we really wanted to design a storage system where you had the ability to change the amount of write bandwidth, the amount of read bandwidth, and the amount of storage that you had to allow us to cope with that huge amount of flexibility. Uh, and we ended up with basically a, a, a design which includes write racks, which are basically, you can think of them as a, as a storage unit which, or as a, as, a, as a rack, sorry, which has the ability to write sort of multiple platters. You end up with a read rack, which is a rack full of read drives, which is able to service reads. You end up with this passive storage rack. Um, they're completely passive. There's no electronics on them. There's no cooling. There's no powering on them because we want them to exist for the lifetime of the data center. That property of how can we store glass in that data center extremely cheaply? Well, just put it, in a, put it in shelving and leave it. And, um, and that's part of that data at rest should not consume any resources. And so that's the kind of design that we went for. I want to show you a little video because we ended up having to design a set of custom robotics and a, a set of custom storage uh, racks to go with it. So this is a, this is a, a video of, hopefully, oh, let me plug that in so we get audio. Why is it not going? Here we go. Oh, hang on. Here it comes. OK, and so this is showing you the shuttles. Um, if you think of a normal tape library, you have a number of gantry robots that often work in the middle. When one of them crashes, you often can't actually get past it. So you lose an entire tape library on the failure of a, of a single um, component. 
Here we went for a model where we have small shuttles that are freely moving around, taking the idea of sort of warehouse robotics. And as you saw in the video, they crab. So they move up and down the shelving. And they're able to, when they stop, they're able to remove a platter. They're able to move to a drive. Uh, they can insert it, then they come back, bring it back, insert the glass back into the thing. And then they can crab to get out the way or to move to another one to pick the, the next one up. So we ended up with a very, very different design of the actual library, combined with a very, very different design, where we have write heads and read heads separately and, um, and glass. So the next thing, and I'm, I'm going to tell you a slight detour here, because um, I'm going to make a confession. Uh, when we did Pelican, and we did the hard disk drive-based archival storage, uh, we sort of sat down and we just sort of used our systems intuition and we thought of what would be a great design point. And um, we built it and it was, not, it was not easy. And it turned out that actually the design point was slightly wrong. And in particular, um, we sort of made an assumption about the number of drives that we would need spinning at any one time, the number of drives we would need to spin up. And one of the reasons I showed you that graph earlier about the power usage was we actually needed to spin up multiple drives together, and the rack only had enough power provisioning to allow you to have one disk being spun up per sort of unit that we had in the power distribution. And um, we kind of discovered about three quarters of the way through that we got it slightly wrong. And, we, and that's when we started to think about we really, really wanted to start to use simulations, emulators and simulators of all the hardware before we built it. Now, that sounds like a very obvious thing, but at the time when we were doing Pelican, um, I think, I think you know, it, it wasn't immediately obvious to us that that was the way that we should have gone. So for Silica, from very early on, we built out simulators to be able to understand the performance of what the system was likely to be like at many levels. Some of them would simulate drives, some, some of them would simulate the entire system, and uh, some of them were discrete event simulators, some of them were, were um, slightly more uh, higher level than that. Um, and so we basically cross-validated. After we built the system, we started to cross-validate the simulation results with the actual platform. They matched remarkably well. Um, we use a large range of tracers to trace. So um, we basically looked for um, a typical workload, the highest IOPS workload we could find, a 12-hour window with the highest IOPS, and also uh, the 12-hour window with the highest volume of data. And so we use those workload traces to sort of evaluate how the system works. And um, I'm only going to talk about two metrics today, which is, um, and I think they're super interesting, though, because they kind of go against what you would think normally. So the first one is, what is the impact of the read drive throughput on the system. Now, if you think of a tape drive, uh, a lot of effort has been put into making the tape drives go higher and higher throughputs. And in fact, you know, if you look at the roadmap, everyone's always very proud that they're going to go even faster. Um, and I'm going to show you what we worked out we needed as the throughput for our read drives in a second and the impact that it had on SLO. And um, the other thing I told you was like, it's really important for us to be able to maximize the utilization of our parts. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how we managed to achieve that with the, with the read drives to get uh, high, um, high utilization. So this is the, the first one. Um, it takes a library, 20 read heads, 20 shuttles, um, platters proportional to the amount of um, data at the trace time. Uh, we look at the 99.9th uh, tail latency. Uh, we take a sort of a, a target SLO of around 15 hours. Um, and what this graph shows you is the read drive throughput versus tail completion time in hours for those three workloads, the high volume one, the high IOPS one, and the typical one. Now, as you would expect, the volume one struggles slightly at really low uh, 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 read throughputs, through, throughputs for the drive. Um, as it gets higher, though, it's sort of, it's sort of uh, OK. What's interesting is even at 30 megabytes per second, we can service the 15-hour um, uh, uh, SLO even for the, for the high volume. By the time you get to 90 megabytes per second, 
you're actually easily, easily beating it. Um, and I think part of, that, part of that reason is is because the workload is so dominated by small reads that it's about getting things through, not about high reading. It's like, you know, whether you spend two seconds or four seconds reading the data, doesn't matter if it's taking you 10 seconds to get the piece of glass in there. It's not the dominant costs. Um, I think also, you know, this also shows that point about the minimizing the uh, mechanical overhead, which is really crucial. So you really want to be able to load platters really quickly. You want to be able to, if necessary, if you're reading, if you've got a platter in that you're doing, say, a verify, so you're reading the whole platter, and you've got other reads coming in which you want to service quickly, the ability to very quickly translate, uh, translate between the two. And so, really interestingly, we actually devised the read drives to have two slots, and we actually use mechanical fast switching to be able to read between two different platters very fast. And in a sense, you can think of this as a physical realization of double buffering. So what this really means is, is that you've taken a lot of the overheads of loading something in whilst you're still actually reading. Then you literally do the last, uh, the switch as quickly as you can, then you're able to read, and then you're able to switch back, which really allows you to drive the utilization of drives up, particularly in this world where we want to do a verification as well as service the read load. And here you can see um, customer reads and verification workloads, average reader, reader utilization for those workloads, which shows you that most of the time they're actually spent doing the verifies, which is unsurprising. They're large reads, they take a lot of time. Um, and yet we're able to get through the customer reads. And that's because we're able to do this, this, this fast switching. Um, so so I, wanna, I wanna sound now sort of just wrap this bit up on silica and start to talk about more generally about some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is that um, it's proved really hard uh, to design something from the media up. Um, I think I said earlier that you know, if we'd known how hard it was when we walked into the Southampton lab, uh, we may not have been brave enough to do it. Um, first off, I, I, I want to just acknowledge that there's an amazing team of colleagues and collaborators that have made this possible. Uh, there's about 50 plus people who currently have worked on silica, and there'll be more as we, as we move uh, forwards. Um, the other interesting thing is, uh, and I think this is one of the things that's been super important, is it's, it's a really, really extremely multidisciplinary team. Uh, there's computer systems people, uh, people with ML background, laser processing physics, free space optics, uh, microscopy, chemistry, electrical and mechanical engineering, uh, industrial designers. There's a whole ton of people that have had to come to together and learn how to effectively communicate with each other to allow us to do this. Um, so that's silica. Um, as well in the team, as well as doing silica, we have been looking at other storage technologies beyond archive. Um, as I said to you at the start, those curves, you know, they're going to impact flash. <laughs> they're going to impact hard disk drives. And I just talked to you about tape. Uh, and, 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 you know, there are really pressing problems. Um, we took it, and we were quite public about it. We took another look at holographic storage. Uh, we worked extremely hard to try to see. And it, it's kind of interesting. So, so one of the questions is, why did we actually look at holographic storage again? Well, we looked at holographic storage because there is a lot of change. There's a lot of evolution and revolution in the optical components that you can get. So things that you might have found really hard to do a decade ago actually are much easier now. And we thought some of those things may unlock holographic storage. Um, we also, so, so, so we had a good look at it. We learned a huge amount, and in fact, you know, we're looking at other technologies now, optical technologies for warmer data, uh, in part based on some of the learnings that we had when we were trying to look at the holographic storage. And I think the thing that keeps us really going is, you know, all of the incumbent technologies, it's really hard to see, not, not how they're going to be here in a year or two's time, they're all quite safe for a year or two, but how is it they're going to be here in a decade? What happens when we can't you know, that's what sort of keeps us awake, and that's why we're investing so much in the space. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons. Um, some of you will think these are quite obvious. Some of you might think they're not, but let me just go through them. Uh, lesson one, you know, cloud scale changes things. Uh, I remember the first time I saw one of our Azure data centers. Uh, it kind of blows you away. You sort of walk around these massive sites. Um, you know, the scale of storage is just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, it is geo-distributed, and you know, one of the really interesting things is 
that not only is it geodistributed, but each site have different kind of uh, uh, demands. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a very dynamic kind of world when it comes to workloads that's, that are different across different data centers. Um, and, you know, the services need to be geo-distributed. Uh, when we first started, you know, the sort of the old notion of hyper-massive data centers was really popular. Today, we tend to deploy more smaller data centers because people want to be able to have sovereign data. They want to be able to keep data within boundaries of countries and so forth. So you have to actually deploy many more data centers. And then, of course, you need to be able to have uh, failure tolerance replication or whatever within those countries. Um, I, I also just want to reiterate, you know, it's now of the scale where I think it can really sustain dedicated technologies. And in fact, you know, Google, Google and in fact, many of the other cloud operators now also, you know, built out their own silicon for doing machine learning. So the Google guys did the TPU. Uh, Amazon have been quite open about the processes that they've been developing, ARM processes and so forth. Um, I, think, I think, you know, we've already seen that in the compute space. I think that is going to happen in the storage space. And I think, um, you know, we, 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 should, we should recognize that. And um, I think what's really interesting, and I, I, I've been really fortunate, as part of this journey, I've been able to talk to lots of people in lots of different industries. Uh, one of the things that I've really taken away as well is that, like, uh, when it comes to personal data, when it comes to, like, our phone and storing data on our phone, whoops, uh, we never worry about the amount of storage, really. So the days when people used to sit there on their phone sort of deleting photos because they'd taken three photos and they were worried about the storage on the phone, it's kind of gone. We're in this era where effectively personal data feels free. In the cloud, people still delete data and they delete it not because of legal or compliance or ethical issues. They simply delete it because it costs a lot of money to keep storing large amounts of data. And I think one of the goals should be to get to the state where we make it possible for people just to keep all the data. And people often say to me, why Ant? And I, and I, and I learned this from the movie industry. So uh, all the big studios have archivists, and their job is to make sure that no movie is ever lost. And one of the reasons that this is so important to them is that the value of the films has changed over time. Now, if you take silent movies, it's actually quite hard to find silent movies, built in the first era of the cinema. Why? Because if you're a movie studio, you filmed a silent movie, you showed it in a cinema, and then that value of that data was precisely zero. There was nowhere else where you could show it. You'd shown it in the cinema, so you discarded it, or you reused the film because film was quite expensive. Then along came TV, and suddenly films became valuable post-cinema. Uh, but yet we still managed in the TV era to dump a lot of um, shows. So, uh, you know, in the UK, where I'm from, uh, there's a lot of effort to find early comedies, classic comedy shows that have just been lost. And every so often you'll see in the newspaper that somebody who's, who has unfortunately now passed on in their attic they discovered a copy of a lost episode of a particular comedy or a particular series that everybody loves. Then, of course, video comes along. Suddenly, the data value changes again. Suddenly, the TV folk are no longer going to bin all their data because they can use video to monetize it afterwards. Then streaming comes along. And this is the challenge, I think, that the value of data changes over time, and we super, super need to build storage in the cloud that doesn't make you make that trade-off today of what is the value that I understand it, it allows you just to keep data because, you know, it could be useful in the future. This lesson two, operational proportionality, uh, you know, data storage cost should be proportional to the number of accesses, not to the data lifetime. I think this is really key. And this is partly about making, data, about making storage sustainable. It's partly about making sure that the energy that we use is making sure that the actual CO2 damage that we do from the supply chain can all be managed. And, you know, moving data around takes energy, replicating data takes energy, um, you know, fixity, fixity checks take energy, and then, you know, actually migrating from media to media takes, takes a lot of uh, energy. And, you know, so I think that's a really good thing. I think the next thing I'm really passionate about, deep, deep co-design. I really believe that we need to design hardware and software together. Um, 
And you know, I often talk to people, and people somehow think the word hardware means silicon. No. I mean, I think hardware means you know, all the hardware that you roll in. And I, at the end, I'm going to give you a little feel about if you start to push on that, one way you might go. I think it's super important that we should be able to optimize across layers. Uh, I think one of the things we've learned is that simple design choices further down the stack can make things so much easier as you go up the stack. And it's often things which, when you look at them in isolation, appear really unobvious. You know, it wasn't immediately obvious that we shouldn't spin the media in silica. It was only as you began to look at the impact, if we did spin the media, what would it do across the stack? How would it impact the service that we could offer? Uh, did it become really clear that it wasn't the right thing to do? The other thing that I'm super, super passionate about is not stranding resources. So I think, uh, you know, if you think of, um, you know, today in storage systems, there's a lot of resources which are just stranded. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, they just sat there being underutilized. Um, if you've got a bunch of hard disk drives, you've got processors in them, you've got memory in them, uh, you've got all, and if they're not servicing anything, that's all just sat there, utilization zero. And that's costing you. So I'm really passionate when we think about storage, how to think about not stranding resources. The way of putting that is to how, how do you just maximize utilization of every component that you build? Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to think about where things happen and why. Flexibility, performance, overheads, you know, these are all, all trade-offs. And um, I think, you know, we often do things for very unobvious reasons. And you should really think about where, where they happen. So, for example, the processing of the images that we take off the drive in silica, we don't do them on the drive, we do them remotely. And, in fact, I was, I was talking to my, a colleague of mine at Microsoft uh, yesterday, Jay, I hope you don't mind me mentioning this about IBM drives, but like uh, Jay was reminding me that you know back in the days when there were hard disk, uh, when there was uh, mainframes, that the hard disk drives that the mainframes used were effectively key value stores, with you know non-uniform sector sizes and so forth and so forth, and um, you know people had this temptation to push things down and down and down. As you push it down and down and down, it gets harder and harder and harder. And Jay was highlighting how. You know, when you move to a world where you know, taking these you know, incredibly new high-tech hard disk drives that we've been used in PC systems that are fixed sector size, uh, how you could still do it, but you do it further up the stack, which makes life somewhat easier. Um, lesson number four, data-driven design. Um, what do those workloads look like? I told you about silica. So many of the design choices we made in silica were based on the fact that um, we really, really, really spent a lot of time thinking and trying to work out what the workloads look like. Um, there's this really awful thing where when you live in a world where people sell components, they tend to get really obsessed about the performance of the component. If you go and read a flash, if you go and buy a flash drive, everyone talks about the IOPS that it can sustain. How many workloads need that IOPS? You know, we get very fixated on headline performance. And I think uh, it's really important to think about what do I actually need? And then what am I paying for that extra performance? I've already mentioned about simulators and emulators. Um, you know, it's really hard. Uh, you want to be able to, I, I would be saying that, you know, I, I think it's just super important to be able to simulate and emulate future technologies before we build them. Um, and we've got to be really careful. Um, before we started on Pelican, we did another project where we spent a lot of time using a well-known simulation package uh, for storage, and it turned out when we actually tried to run it on real hardware, even though the type of, the type of drives matched, everything matched, there was just a huge difference between what we saw in reality from the simulator and what the real world was showing us. And it's that, in fact, it was that experience that put us off simulators. And then I think, you know, you need to build the correct ones. You need to build them which are going to be realistic and able to do what you need them to do. So I'm going to stop in a second, but I just wanted to feel, give you a feel for where next. Um, and I think, you know, two paths seem really attractive um, to us in Cambridge. The first one um, is really about going that level five, going to materials and the co-design of materials as well. Um, you know, silica is what I call a level four system. You know, glass is not novel. You can go out and buy glass today. Um, but there are materials out there which are potentially unknown which may be really good for storage systems. And I think there's a lot of excitement about this. And at the moment, finding those materials honestly feels like searching for needles in a haystack. 
Um, you, know, you know, if you're a physicist, you may well work on trying to find a material, you'll find it, you'll write a paper about it, and it will be an entire PhD to find the material sort of thing. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of hype at the moment about, about using um, foundational models and things like that to drive that sort of thing. Um, the second thing which I think, which is a little bit more random, uh, is about thinking about building self-maintaining storage systems by design. And what I mean by that is thinking beyond the, the normal boundaries. So thinking about how you can actually create hardware that can effectively self-maintain. So taking the co-design to the next level. Now, you know, at the moment, it is quite normal for us to think of software and it masks hardware failures. And effectively, sort of the big high-level mantra would be like, you know, you've got to do something to minimize the, the vulnerability window. So if a hard disk drive fails, you've then got to start replicating, or you've got to start rebuilding from using fusing and erasure coding, rebuilding and copying that data again. Um, the challenge is, is, you know, scale of resource that fails is getting larger. You know, a single tape library can be hundreds of petabytes, and it goes offline in one go. Um, one of the things I've learned, when, I, when we first started, I used to think, We'll, 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 you know, we'll make Pelican do graceful degradation. But uh, it's really interesting. People who run services tend to not like graceful degradation. Uh, they tend to like it to sort of basically do what it says or not do it. And that's for a really good reason, because, in fact, it adds more complexity in higher up. Um, and I think, that, you know, as you get these bigger and bigger systems, we need to think about how to handle these, handle these failures. Graceful degradation is not necessarily the way to handle them. And I, I mean, the obvious one, you know, at scale, Failures are often not binary, they're transient. Uh, you know, as people walk around data centers, things change because they're walking around and so forth. Um, so the question is, is you know, at the moment when hardware failures happen, the software masks it, and then some poor human is dispatched, and they might reseat parts, they might replace a hard disk drive, they might replace a flash drive. Um, now thinking of this co-design, what would a set of racks look like that were actually self-maintaining? What would the storage, what would the hard disk drives, what would the flash drives, what would everything in them look like if we had to build them to be able to be self-maintained? So, you know, in a sense, when a failure happens, rather than the software just masking it, uh, something comes along, some automation, and actually fixes it. And I think that would change the way that we build storage systems again. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, I had a few part, uh, parting thoughts, but we're sort of at time. So I think, thank you for listening. Um, thank you also to all the amazing uh, collaborators and colleagues I've had out there. The stuff I again talked to you about today is, you know, it's a cast of hundreds uh, who have really done it all. Um, but if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you very much.